and welcome. Um, today we are talking about sharing modules. Um, and just to give a little bit of context, I can't remember exactly how this happened, but I, I was chatting with one of the folks on the panel um, and they were just telling me about some interesting things. I think it might've been Julie um, when she was first starting to uh, do some work both with the technology of, of sharing, um, but then thinking about her program a little bit. And I thought, you know, it's really helpful when we're thinking about things like cluster curriculum and that kind of stuff um, and interdisciplinary connections to actually have concrete examples of curriculum that faculty are developing. And when you hear about faculty curriculum, I think it gives you all sorts of ideas of things that might work in your areas. So that's what we're doing today. We are talking about uh, modules that are in development from different parts of our campus. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. and have to get to the right screen, there we go. Um, okay, so why might we want to share modules? Your reasons might be very different um, and very personal. Um, so these are actually just some of the things that our group talked about when they were talking about their motivations. Um, so obviously at Plymouth, you know, with cluster learning, we're thinking about, sorry about that. Um, I shouldn't have clicked on it. Um, we're thinking about uh, de-siloizing a little bit and bringing students from different disciplines together. So some of the examples you'll see today do that. Um, also, there's been lots of talk, particularly at the board level for about uh, cost savings and efficiency. We know that by trying to eliminate low enrolled courses at Plymouth in what ways could um, modules be helpful to some of the efficiencies that we want to achieve, especially if they will allow us to keep certain kinds of curriculum that we think is really important. Um, maybe we can share workloads or standardize outcomes in certain areas where there might be multiple sections of one kind of course where we, we are hoping that the outcomes across those sections are more standardized. Um, we've got examples where people are working on project-based learning. Um, there's not as much in here today, but we've been uh, talking about the possibility of using modules for projects so that people from different teams with different kinds of expertise can come together for a couple of weeks to work on a particular project within the scope of courses. Um, you'll see some of the stuff we talk about today is about certain kinds of things that are important at Plymouth State, for example, the habits of mind. Could we develop some modules? Um, another thing I was thinking about was just writing across the curriculum. Could there be certain kinds of modules that we bring forward in certain kinds of, kinds of classes so that students are getting reintroduced to that material multiple times, maybe at multiple levels with different activities? Um, obviously, there may be some use here when we're talking about uh, course sharing across USNH. Um, and in general, what would it mean if we developed modules um, that we could actually share with the public, with people who aren't enrolled at Plymouth State or any USNH institution? So there's lots of opportunities here for thinking about um, modules. Just to define it, um, and we're not gonna get specifically into this, the CoLab does have a whole program on like, what is a module? How do you design modules? So if you want that, just um, contact us at psu-open at Plymouth.edu, I can send it to you. But really what we're talking here are, are um, sometimes what faculty call units, um, smaller curricular components that fit inside of a course. And that could be anything from like a day long, um, you know, uh, piece that's really designed to take one class period to something that's more like one to three or four weeks. Um, some courses may be built across a whole semester, but they may only have four modules in them, right? So um, there's also uh, co-curricular possibilities with modules that sit outside of credit bearing experiences. So staff might be interested in um, building modules. Uh, we work on some in the CoLab to deal with student workers, for example. Um, so that's what we're talking about today. We have some wonderful guests with us. Um, I think what I'll do is I will just introduce the first one. And as we go, we'll introduce folks as they um, come along. So first up is going to be Julie Bernier. So uh, Julie, if you maybe just say a word about who you are before you go in and off you go. Sure. 
I'm Julie Bernier, a faculty member in health and human performance. Uh, for me, this uh, topic came about when um, I was going to be playing a particular role in the collab this year, and uh, it was about the cluster, cluster curriculum. And so I interviewed about six or eight people about what they thought a cluster curriculum is, Robin and Dawn and Ann and Pat and Kathy and a couple more people. Um, and, and this term um, kept coming up from Don. When, when I talked to Don, this was the nature of the conversation. And he really, I asked him, what would be success to you this year uh, in terms of um, cluster curriculum? And he said he really would like to see us move to creating some module. He, he used the term modularization of the curriculum. And so thinking more about that, um, I took that back and, uh, and the HHP faculty at our retreat had a conversation around this idea to see where do we think that uh, we have some low hanging fruit um, to, to potentially do something like this. And so the two areas that came up immediately were uh, our intro to the major courses, and then we have a research stats methods kind of course that goes across the um, the curriculum. So that first one, um, the intro courses specifically, it's not all of our majors, but it's most of them. The, and you can see the, the majors on the left there, the intro courses for each of those. So uh, to be honest, COVID has put a little bit of a damper on our progress <laughs> in this, um, not because of COVID, but simply because as you know, I mean, we're all just keeping our heads barely above water with everything else. And just having the bandwidth to actually focus on this has been challenging, but we have made some progress. So I feel good that we've done something. So we have uh, a couple of groups that have come together to talk about, uh, talk about what this might look like. And we started with um, talking about our common content and, and developing a list of what do we do and then we could see where either we currently do it in all of the courses uh, or we don't do it, but we want to in each uh, in each of the courses. And so that list is up there. Uh, you know, one of the things we in some areas we do really well and others we don't. And that's the, the whole college success study, study skills, taking notes, et cetera. Some of us are not doing it at all, but really want to. And we think our students need it much more. And you can see the topics that we came up with there that we think cross all of those disciplines and we could have one or more module, it would be more than one module uh, in those areas. Um, and then we got to a place where we, our disciplines definitely diverge and we need to cover some introductory content specific to our majors. So we would see that we would have con uh, modules on some of those um, topics, and then we could split out into our disciplines. Um, and I'll talk more at the very end about pros, cons, challenges, and so forth. And then the other one was um, our research and design stats and possible modularization of that. And again, you see the four classes here, and they are pretty different. Two of them are, are epidemiology, uh, health science, public health-ish um, kinds of classes. Uh, one is a regular research methods, experimental design kind of class. And then the measurement assessment class is kind of a hybrid between research design and specific measurement content. This one's been, um, I thought this was gonna be the easiest one, it, but it's turned out to be a little bit more challenging. The folks that are working on this group said they think the other group's gonna be easier than, than this one. And I think it's because there's more, um, uh, there's more of a divergence in the topics, but we definitely have some of the same topics that you do in, in every research class, right? How to conduct a lit search and critically read and analyze, writing a review of literature, basic stats and research methods and design. So we could have a couple of um, modules in those areas and then again break out into the discipline um, the various disciplines and so like I said I'm going to come back and, and talk about the um, kind of the where we're at right now and some questions that we have and challenges 
Uh, great. Next up, um, we are going to, and uh, again, after after Julie brings it back to questions at the end, we're also gonna have time for all of us to talk together and you can ask other questions. Um, but now I'm going to ask Maria Sanders um, to talk a little bit about her work. All right, thanks. Um, again, I am a faculty member in philosophy and this was a shared module created for instructors teaching tackling a wicked problem. Um, it really is designed to offer uh, examples of learning outcomes that students can use that are trying to acquire a practical understanding of the habits of mind. But I think the approach that's used here is something that could be used not only in various general education sorts of courses, but in all kinds of even upper level discipline specific courses as well. So the approach is in general one that starts with like narrowly defined activities and it's set up sort of like an a la carte, you know, where instructors can come in and choose from various examples of activities or they can just use it as motivation to design their own activities, just to give them ideas. Um, but it starts with these narrowly designed activities and then scaffolds up the learning or builds upon those narrowly designed activities uh, towards a broader assignment. And of course, the ultimate goal then is to have this really reflective piece in a common assessment. So in this particular shared module, um, the three, I guess I would call them themes uh, that I initially designed this around. And again, these could also change, uh, but I was thinking of it from the standpoint of an incoming freshman student who's really not even familiar with what it means to be a college student, let alone Plymouth State University. So I set it up in these like three themed areas of first, and this is a very Socratic notion, know thyself. So get to know you, and then getting to know your classmates, getting to know Plymouth State University. So the module has multiple examples uh, that are activities that instructors could use under each of these headings, or if they didn't wanna do all three, whichever ones they choose. For example, getting to know you. Uh, maybe they wanna use an uh, online, um, kind of one of these little quick tests that uh, test social habits or personal biases, and then have the students write a short reflective journal piece. Or maybe they want to do a mind mapping around a question like, you know, what does college success mean to you? But things that would let the students explore and get to know more about their own strengths as well as their own weaknesses and how they can play to their strengths and then build upon those uh, kind of filling in the holes and uh, building upon the, the weak areas. Uh, and then getting to know your classmates, again, uh, could even use these as some icebreakers if they wanted to. Uh, they could break into small groups and do something like um, focusing on a challenge that they faced and the steps that they took to overcome that challenge. Or if we move to getting to know mm -hmm. Plymouth State University, I think there's a plethora of things that we could do with our students that would help them not only become familiarized with the university, but in the sense also have this exposure to experiencing the habits of mind. So perhaps we want them to research minors and do a presentation on which minor aligns best with their major so that they would have to not only become familiar with our minors, but really understand our general education program, really start thinking about not just selecting classes that uh, avoid Thursday nights or Friday uh, classes, but that really build towards uh, a broader outcome. And then uh, taking these narrow defined assign uh, activities and building it into a broader assignment, um, here they could take something like, uh, the assignment I framed here is a strategic plan for college success that they're writing for themselves. So they could create a plan that utilizes self-identified -identi uh, strengths and weaknesses that basically build upon that getting to know you activity section uh, and critically analyze the available opportunities, again, that builds upon the getting to know Plymouth State University while anticipating potential challenges that emerge builds upon uh, this activity of getting to know your classmates. And again, it's really not even about the assignment, although they're learning valuable lessons at each of these levels. Ultimately, what we want is the reflective piece. So in tackling a wicked problem, there's a common assessment where they um, really are challenged to write, you know, a reflective essay analyzing the ways in which developing and 
uh, writing a personalized strategic plan for college success assisted in understanding their understanding of and experience with the four habits of mind would be one way that they could uh, assess uh, in a very reflective and kind of deeply meaningful way, uh, their understanding of these uh, habits of mind. So again, it's kind of a, a very flexible approach where students can, or instructors can select activities they want to use, particular um, assignments or assessments they want to use, or just use it as motivation, you know, to be designing and building their own. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, when we were talking about this in our group, we just thought, you know, habits of mind is one particular sort of Plymouth State thing that we want to stress in multiple courses. But if we thought about it, we could come up with others of those. And so what might it be helpful um, to have modules for different things? Um, and I, I really like the approach to this too, which reminds me a little bit of what we sometimes in the collab have called assignment banks. Um, so that instead of just the idea that you're going to take a module off the shelf and just sort of like robo teach it. Um, instead, it's designed to give you ideas to spark creativity. Um, and then when you participate in the module, you also improve it, you put your stuff back in, um, you can, you can um, build it out in some ways. Um, so I, I like that, that kind of approach to it. Um, when we put this together, I also wanted to be sensitive that there is some technology that sits behind this kind of work um, that might be more than you need to do if you are not using shared modules, right? Because now you have to figure out how to take curriculum and share it. And in the old ways of doing things, for example, in Moodle, you know, you, you can't just share something out of your Moodle, you know, and like give it to your friend in your department. Um, so I asked our uh, friends at USNH um, Academic Technology to see if they could um, talk to us a little bit about Canvas, which some of us are using already and some of us aren't, and how Canvas and in particular Canvas Commons might offer us um, some help. But uh, before Rachel talks about this, I just want to remind you that Canvas Commons is, I, I think, a pretty cool part of Canvas. But lots of us are doing module sharing by using the open web with Plymouth Create because it's very easy to share things on the open um, web. You will see an example after Rachel um, from Kayla who is using SharePoint. So this is just one way that um, Plymouth will offer you that will be very easy and well suited to modularity. But you know, your creativity is the only limit in terms of how you can build and, and share modules using technology. So with that, I will ask Rachel to introduce yourself um, to folks who may not know you yet. Hey everybody, my name is Rachel Sapko. Um, like Robin said, I'm on the learning design technology team um, on the Durham campus. And then I also work for the iLearn New Hampshire team, which brings uh, Canvas, Kaltura and Zoom to K-12 schools across New Hampshire. And before I started doing that, I was a K-12 teacher. So a little bit of education and tech across the way. Um, so like Robin said, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about commons today which is a learning object repository within Canvas that allows you to both find, import, and share different resources. What I think is really cool about Commons is you can put an entire course in there, you can put a single page in there, you can put a whole module, just an assignment, or a, just a quiz in there. And so listening to both Maria and Julie kind of talk about some of the stuff you guys are thinking about sharing, whether it's, you know, um, a unit from the Habits of Mind class, whether it's a common assessment, whether it's a discussion board or a rubric, all of that can be pushed right out into commons and then teachers can pull them in and use them as they want to and still have that flexibility, that freedom and that creativity to do what they want with them. So some really nice things with commons is there's a bunch of different ways that you can share it. So you can share it with other teachers or departments. So you can just put it out there, make it a available to anybody at Plymouth and then they can go, they can pull it into their class and use it as they want. You can also share within um, the USNH system, which is really cool because then somebody at the Durham campus might say, hey, I think Habits of Mind is really cool. I can use that in my own course. Um, and then we're also exploring the option of sharing publicly with all Canvas users, which means that anybody who uses Canvas anywhere could bar can use your content um, and use it in their own course. 
And I think that's really cool to kind of piggyback off what Robin was saying. You know, as a teacher, I was always really inspired by what other people did. If I was, I was an English teacher. So if I was teaching Macbeth, I'd be like, oh, how did somebody else do this? And I'd look at other people's lessons and I'd be like, oh, I want to borrow that. And I'm going to use a little bit of that. And so Canvas Commons, I think is cool, especially when you're new, because you can see how other people are designing content, how they're using rubrics, how they're making, designing their pages for their classes. Um, and really use that to build the best class that you can. And you can modify anything you pull in to fit whatever needs you have. So some really big advantages of that. It's really easy to import and edit. Once it's within your Canvas course, you can do whatever you want. You can add, you can delete, you can change. Um, you can put in different variety of types. So if you just need a quiz, you can search for a quiz. If you want a whole course, you can do that too. And everything in Commons is searchable. You can tag it, you can look by titles, by grades, by outcomes. Um, and you can also look at the licenses. So things can be um, create a commons license, they can be copyrighted, which ensures that you kind of have some control over that content once you put it out there. Um, a couple of quick disadvantages. You don't get any kind of notification that somebody's using your stuff. Like once it's out there, it's there and people can borrow it and use it as many times as they want. Nothing is vetted. Like we on the LDT team aren't sitting here going through every single thing that gets put into commons and saying like, yes, this is a good resource or no, this one's not. So you're, you have to kind of go through them yourselves and decide what works or doesn't work for you. And then just once it's out there, it's out there. You can't suddenly be like, oh no, Robin took my stuff. I don't want her to have it. I want it back now. Um, you know, once it's out there, it's out there um, and people can change it and do what they want to it. Um, kind of with the caveat of how you license it when you put it out there. but. Definitely a really great resource and a great way to kind of, you know, do that sharing, to push it out, to share with other people and see what others are doing so you can build out those classes and those commonalities among them. Excellent. And just to reiterate, if you want help sort of conceiving of a module or thinking about how a module might work in your program or in your courses, um, that would be a great thing for Martha to help you with in the collab. Um, when you're ready to sort of think about the technology that you want to support your module, if you're interested in learning more about Canvas Commons, um, not only are there gonna be uh, plenty of workshops both in May and in August on Canvas, but um, you can also put in the technology ticket for Rachel's team and they will be happy to one-on-one -on -one partner with you um, to help you, uh, you know, make sure you're saving things as you want to so that you can share those maybe amongst uh, three or four faculty who are working on something. The other thing I think about when Rachel's talking is um, about using undergraduates to do more teaching and how cool it would be um, to involve uh, more undergraduate TAs in co-creating and running modules. So, you know, the idea of being able to scaffold like the key parts of a module and then work on that for a couple of weeks with an undergraduate senior, say for example, and then give them a couple of weeks in the class to teach that module. I think there's a lot of possibility there. And I don't just mean like TAs who, who partner with you, also like potentially over time, finding ways for upper class students to really take those modules, you know, and, and, and fully teach them. And maybe we aren't, you know, involved in that. Like we aren't sitting there watching everything that they do. Um, you know, I would think about that with graduate students too. I think we have a little bit less of that going on now because of some of the cuts, but um, really interesting how modules can provide a little bit of scaffold and still have a lot of openness for people to develop on their own. Uh, so with that, we are going to turn to our final presenter, um, Kayla. So Kayla, if you want to just um, introduce yourself and uh, talk a little, and when you're ready, just let me know and I will let you share your screen. Awesome. Thank you, Robin. So my name is Kayla Gaudet, um, and I'm here in a couple capacities. So I am uh, the Director of Operations for Health and Human Performance, which means that I really help to um, organize the faculty and the administrative side of uh, running an academic unit. Um, and part of that role is actually mentoring and working to develop our teaching lectures. So um, the two things that I'm gonna speak on um, are the general education habits of mind, which I also am a teaching lecturer and I teach tackling a wicked problem, which is like a first year seminar for Plymouth State students. And in this project-based class, we teach the habits of mind. Um, it's really the introduction to habits of mind. And so I learned about it through the collab, through working with Kathy, um, who leads the general education at Plymouth. 
But what I realized was that some of the teaching lecturers don't really um, know all the habits of mind. They're not as dialed in. So I saw this as a really fun way to practice modules. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Thank you, Ralphin. Make sure I share the right one. Okay. Julie, you're the first person I see. Do you see the SharePoint okay? Awesome. Okay. So this is built in SharePoint, so a little bit different than Canvas. I'm really excited to see how it could be built in Canvas Commons, though. Um, but this is what I had available at the time. So you can see just a general overview, um, and then you click right in to begin. So if any of you participated in ACE, you probably recognize the format uh, a little bit. So if we click on module one here, you'll go ahead and see. Um, there's a flow to it. You'll, the teaching lecturers would watch a quick video um, and then a call to action or a reflection here um, with a checklist and then any resources for them. And so if we go back to our home, I'll show another module really quick. So again, the same theme, um, watch a quick video of information and then a reflection call to action. Um, and so what you'll see here is there about let's see, it's about four modules and then a final reflection. So what are the general education habits of mind? You know, how do you apply them to your syllabus? How do you incorporate the habits of mind into your assignments? And then what, why are they important? And then a final module and reflection where the teaching lecturers would then uh, engage on a team site where they're, they're participating with sharing assignments um, and just talking about their experience with one another. And so I hope to roll this out this summer to our teaching lecturers who teach a course that has that gen ed component. We have a lot of wellness choices courses, which has um, the wellness connection component, and they have to incorporate at least one habit of mind into that. And so hopefully what we'll see is through this, it's on uh, their own time. The teaching lecturers can go through or really any faculty at PSU who might be teaching a gen ed um, designated course could go through learn the habits of mind and hopefully it will the engagement pieces will sustain over time um, where they can see, um, they can keep engaging with one another um, for assignment ideas with habits of mind, kind of what Maria was talking about, um, which could be in, in the commons on Canvas. Um, and so I actually shared this with the Gen Ed uh, committee and we did a presentation over January Jamboree and I know that they're gonna be working on um, utilizing this to help teach the habits of mind too. The second part, so I'll stop sharing so that Robin can take over again, um, is with the wellness choices, the teaching lectures that I work with have been talking about, um, we have eight, probably about eight sections with eight different faculty members who teach wellness choices. And so what they wanted to work on was transforming one lesson into a collaborative module across the eight sections. Um, and so every single one of these sections, they talk about the seven dimensions of the wellness wheel. And so, so what we have with these faculty is they each have their own areas of expertise. Some are in mindfulness, some are in personal training um, and different backgrounds. And so each faculty would create two to three modules based on their backgrounds that fit within um, one of the seven dimensions of wellness. They would create the module format, video, check for understanding and engagement prompts. And basically it would be this assignment bank, like Robin was saying, where students could go in um, with a level of agency and they could pick which ones they wanna learn about. Um, and then it would culminate into one final project, but it shared across all eight sections. So we hope to do some of this work over summer and then over the next academic year. And it's been really, really fun and creative. Awesome. Um, I'm going to, Julie had actually just made a slide about um, questions and challenges. So I'm going to ask Julie to go through that first and then um, maybe some other folks can, um, can chime in about that. And then, and then we'll all talk together about pros and cons as you see them in this. So go ahead, Julie. Okay. So going back to uh, thinking about our modules that we might create, um, we're at the point now where we, we have more questions than we have answers, and some of them present challenges, and we're not really sure what's the best direction to go. So the first one is uh, how to treat the, the modules. Are they, are they actual classes? Is, is each module a class? Like, would we have take a four-credit class and have four one-credit classes? Um, or would we have 
maybe a, um, a two credit class and then break down to the discipline specific that I talked about. The challenge that we see with that one is many of, um, many of the, those, well, not the intro classes, but the, um, the, those stats classes carry gen ed, um, gen ed discipline, what's the word I'm looking for? They're gen eds, <laughs> right? They're connections. And they have to be three credit classes. Uh, at least a three credit class. So I don't know what we would do if we broke it down into uh, a two credit and then uh, you know maybe maybe two one credit classes. It's a conversation that we could certainly have if we wanted to go in that direction. Another option would be to keep it as keep each one of them as their own class, uh, but break the the students into modules. You could leave those classes uh, as a three or four credit class, schedule them simultaneously, uh, and then have students go in modules. You could combine all the students into one large section for the stats portion of, um, of the stats class, uh, or you could break them into smaller groups and they cycle through modules. So uh, an instructor would repeat the same content two or three times depending on, on what you need. So some of the challenges that we have, um, uh, classroom capacity, if we do a large, if we put everybody into one large section, um, th these classes are full. Our classes are 35 to 40 students in those classes that I've talked about. And so we'd be talking about a class of 120 if we put them all in one class. Um, then, you know, there's scheduling questions. How do we schedule and faculty load if people are teaching one and two credit classes? Um, and, then, and then we think about, you know, so what have we gained? You go back to Robin's first slide where we talk about, you know, why we might want to do this. You know, one reason um, is the interdisciplinarity and uh, we talk about it as, you um, interprofessional education, bringing people together that are going to be physical therapists, athletic trainers, OTs, exercise physiologists, public health specialists, physical and health educators, right? So <clears throat> interprofessional education is happening there. So that's a positive. On the financial side, I, I, I'm having trouble finding any financial gain for our specific application because our classes are already full. If we had multiple sections of small low enrolled courses and we brought them together we would definitely gain some uh, uh, financial gain but I, i'm having trouble finding that um, possibility so anyway so these are just a few of the questions that we have at this point and you know i'm maybe some of you have some ideas other things that we could consider and i know there's been some chatting going on but i cannot read and speak at the same time so now i'm going to read the chat <laughs> um okay so um I don't know what I just did, but I hope I did the right thing. So anyway, uh, that is all that we prepared. And I know that when I heard these folks go, I just started having a bunch of, of different ideas. IDS has been experimenting with this a little bit. We just split our intro course into two two credit experiences, partially because we thought um, we could attract a wider and more diverse group for part of that curriculum, whereas one part was clearly very specific to IDS majors, right? Nobody else wants to design an IDS major, but an IDS major. Um, so that really got us thinking about um, how you can in some ways do broader and more creative things if you are willing to carve things up into smaller bits, which um, was hard to get our heads around at first. So I guess my question is, um, do people have questions for any of the presenters or just wanna um, toss out some ideas or thoughts? And it's we're a small enough group, you can just unmute and go ahead. I know one thing that got me thinking when Julie was sharing just about the modules um, and kind of the gains and then the things that might need to be improved was, 
this is really making me think of the flipped classroom modality that we, you've talked about in the collab a bit, uh, Robin, where students will go off to some of these modules online in their own time, or I mean, it still counts as class time, but then you really utilize that in person in class time really specifically uh, for moments of connection or things that you can accomplish online. But it was interesting to look just listening to everyone's presentation of how so much of this is all led and designed tech wise canvas SharePoint. It's just interesting to look at um, and think about the, the in person piece. Yeah, and I'm just thinking about Bridget's comment there about citizen science, um, which is something that Keen has really spent a lot of time focusing on. And I'm thinking it even just the language of modules and something like Canvas, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan, but Canvas Commons would make it really easy to do say like a two week citizen science shared project across three or four you know science things all you really have to do to start even is lay out some of your goals and carve out your your time and your process and you could hook those classes up um pretty easily i think so some of that stuff sounds really exciting to me and i like the fact that the commons also does allow you to have some of these public interfaces, which we're trying to work, the um, IT folks are trying to work out now, because with citizen science, you really could potentially, you know, if you're working on a watershed project or whatever, you could have people who live nearby collecting things, participating. Um, so all of that PBL approach to, which I think we're already like is becoming a flavor at Plymouth because of TWP, we could imagine scaling that I think into our disciplines pretty well. Robin, uh, I'm thinking about um, Rachel's presentation and, and the collab and some of the modules that we um, talked about, even, even our um, intro to the major courses, um, some of those skills are across campus, right? We're all thinking about how to help students be successful. Is anybody planning to build some modules in canvas that for psu or, or any of us or collab or martha or anyone um gonna build anything like i'm thinking about we could use a library module or pages right we could use uh study skills and and uh note taking we could use uh where are the resources on campus all the services um is anybody taking that on I mean, we we did a tiny bit with COVID around that, and I think there's there's pros and cons, right? On the pro side, like you want to have those resources available, and then the con side is the horrible feeling that like we're going to end up sending students with needs to these online help sites, which just don't have a very good track record. So we, you, you know this from taking, for example, sexual assault, you know, sexual harassment trainings on Moodle. Um, <clears throat> there are limitations, right? So I, I think one of the things that would have to happen first is sorting out which things can be delivered in such a like fully self-service kind of way, right? Like you go in, you do a fully self-paced online, you know, thing and you get exactly what you need and you don't need anybody else's interference versus the stuff that really takes um, humans inside of it to make it function for you. And those are two really different kinds of modules to design, right? The um, sort of competency-based self-paced help sites. Um, ver and that's the stuff that we sometimes don't have a great track record with. Like I remember reading about students who were challenged during COVID and one of the things um, that people were saying in the literature was like, if somebody's really challenged with online learning, do not send them a module on how to succeed in online learning, <laughs> like and ask them to like go through that themselves and learn it. Um, so I, I, I don't know who's in charge of this, but I like the idea of designing some of that stuff for students and maybe having a bigger philosophical conversation about the modalities and the um, you know, I, I think one of the ways to go is peer to peer, like you, we build some of those and then we get student mentors in there. Um, one of our collab students did this with 
in some classes um, during COVID, she would visit to walk students through the resources that are available. And I think she was such a big part of why that was helpful because the resources were there before Grace went in, right? So I don't know, I, it's a great question. We could certainly do some of that, Kathy. I mean, some of, some of it's I, even, I, even, I'm sorry, Kathy, some of it's even um, simpler than that, right? I mean, yes, yes, build some modules, but some of it is just a matter of where are the resources? And you guys built something like this that we shared. I'm thinking about everyone is going to Canvas. There's 250 faculty that all have to recreate this process. We're all going to be trying to create the same content. If we had a couple of pages um, that, we, that we could automatically put into our Canvas classes, we wouldn't all have to recreate the wheel and go and find all of that information. And it would make it easier for the students. You know, a student is in, a, is in their class and they think, oh, where is it that I go for such and such help? And they would know right where to go because they saw it in one of their other classes and they, they know where it is in that uh, course. I think to Julie's point, like that's something we advocate in the, for K-12 too, like having that, especially for people who are new to Canvas, like just having a common like set of pages or one module, like in Canvas, what would be a module like that just really quick says like, you know, you have to hit next to go to the next page or you have to click here to go to the discussion board. Or this is like where you click to get help or here's the link to the library, like right. having that common thing. And I'm even thinking at the college, like one thing we always tell high school teachers too, is have like that common like plagiarism unit. Like these are all the things that count as plagiarism kind of thing. And like you said, like not having a hundred people recreate the wheel, but like just students know it's pinned to the top. They go to it every time. It's just something everybody can kind of pull in. So I think that those can be really great resources, especially when you have a lot of new students coming into Canvas who've never used it before to have just, you know, some real quick stuff that says like, these are the real basics of navigating it or where to go for help. So they're not digging through other things. I, 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 get, I was going to add something that's related to everything that just got said um, and related to Liz's comment in the chat about thinking about modules as asynchronous. I mean, I think that's one way to think about modules that we build these modules that students can then go off and do by themselves. That isn't what I was thinking about when, when you were talking, Robin, about uh, 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 with the comments that you made. I was thinking more like, if we built these common modules, say for uh, research methods class, right? I'm thinking about that, like you've got however many courses you listed, Julie, for in your, um, your AU, but there's, there's tons of them across campus and they all try to do some of the same things. If we built modules that were um, almost like interchangeable it would mean that we, we might be able to have students be more flexible about which of those modules they signed up for, which are, are not asynchronous, they're synchronous, right? And, and that would help with some low enrolled classes that we have. But more importantly for me, I think is, it would get students in a classroom space with students who are not from their discipline, right? In interdisciplinary groups so that they would have some of that cross-discipline conversation. So to me, that's like an even bigger advantage of thinking about, thinking carefully about which things can we modularize and, and allow our students that sort of cross-pollination in their classes. Can I comment on that? Actually, I'm so, I'm really glad you said that because uh, that's actually where I started with the stats as a as a possible uh, low hanging fruit for modulars for modules, um, and I was thinking across the campus, you know, because we probably have twenty five versions of that class across the campus. But then I decided, okay, let's just let's start little. <laughs> let's start with with HHP and see if we can do it in HHP. And if we can, then we can reach out and and try to. Um, you know, see if other disciplines are interested in this idea. So I, I, I agree. I, I think if we could figure that out, it would be, it would be great uh, for the interdisciplinarity as well as potentially cost savings. And I hadn't thought about flexibility for students. That's another really good reason. We had talked about some of the structures of potential interdisciplinary curricular building. Um, 
we had a program in the collab uh, probably two years ago or something where we did things like talk about the spoken hub model. I don't know if anyone was at these, um, but modules are kind of interesting that way too, because you know you can do this large scale with, with majors and programs where spokes and hubs are like courses, but it does seem a little more palatable to do it on a smaller scale where you can be thinking about you know, hubs that are common modules that have spokes coming off that are, you know, um, particular to disciplines or to certain professional work or whatever. Um, and then you can also think even outside of those spokes, you can think about um, coming back together with that kind of common share back, right? So you have a core, everybody goes out and does their separate learning in their fields. And then you sort of come back and now you're educated interdisciplinary team, right? Where you can do stuff. And I think, you know, it, you could build um, inside of one program, um, a small series of things that, that worked that way. And again, I, I think modularity and in instructional design is often very skills oriented because a lot of it was born with the technology that, went along with that competency-based self-paced stuff, right? So, you, you know, we're used to a lot of that approach in modules, but I don't see any way, reason why you can't build, you know, a fully PBL emergent module, right? The module could literally have as its first thing, like set your learning outcomes for this module, right? So I think we want to be careful um, when we talk about building modules to, not assume that there has to be course, um, you know, uh, content, right? Like um, either content or skills that it could be dispositional. It could be about practice. It could be about projects. Um, it, not that you don't wanna do the other stuff. I remember years ago talking to Jeremiah about how modules could potentially, um, I would say save or have saved. I don't know if we lost already chemistry by delivering some of that content in very particular online self-delivered ways. Um, but that's only one part of it, right? Um, to, to do, because TWP I think is a real example of how you can, you know, I mean, in some ways that's, a, that's already a big module, right? It's shared amongst many faculty, but one course looks very different from another in terms of the actual content that's being shared. So. Um, I, I love this and I just want to make sure that we see the benefits of modules to competency-based, skills-based, content-based, but also the benefits of modules to freeing up time for play and connection across diverse people. Because as, if you can free up those credits and those spaces for people to come together, you can let them, you know, design those experiences, I think, just as effectively. So anyway, I'm really excited and I... I <laughs> I think the things you guys are working on are gonna be successful. Um, and one of the questions is how do we get these examples out a little bit for people? Um, I'd like to see, you know, we got Maria in here with uh, philosophy and there's a lot of openness, I think, in her module. I would really like to see stuff coming particularly out of the humanities. Um, I just, you know, as a humanist, I just feel like, oh, there's just so much potential there for, um, yeah, for play. Uh, anybody else have any last questions, comments, ideas before we close it out? I guess I just, um, I'll jump in. When you were just talking there, Robin, and sort of picking, piggybacking on some other comments, um, I immediately started thinking of Abby Good's, um, the, the exercises that she's done in classes to to illustrate ideas of what interdisciplinarity is and thinking about you know people working together across disciplines and how she houses that within a particular course but part of me is like that would be great in so many different courses that i teach that have an element like that so i was thinking about it on a really granular um scale kind of like maria's thinking where it's like a particular um something embedded within a course but even courses that are wildly different, like I'm thinking of my upper level Worko for bio majors, but it's also, I'm also now getting um, 
allied health sciences and um, ES and P students in there, which is great. But like at the beginning, I have to kind of, you know, part of what I want to do is talk about like, well, how do we talk to and write for people and, you know, with, with diverse interests and backgrounds. And I would love to have something that I could bring in that wouldn't just be me, um, you know, sort of my perspective, but could be something that I could adapt in that has all those good bits. And in TWP, I actually pulled in Matt Cheney's video that like describes um, interdisciplinary thinking and disciplines. And I use that, but it was sort of kind of hodgepodge on the fly. It'd be way more awesome if it was something that was a little more well thought out that was like a module that I could I could deploy and use in in lots of different courses so I have a similar thought about how rich it is when I'm able to have guest speakers come um, but you know to ask the guest speakers to come again and again and again semester after semester after semester it just kind of wears wears thin really fast but to have to have Maria do a That's module I was thinking about just, just speak as about talking, ethics in public health. It might be worthwhile cool. for us to have some sort of a, I don't know if it's a Google Docs or, but like a brainstorming of here's our wish list of the kinds of modules we'd like to see. Because as Bridget was talking, I'd love to see something around the IRB process and that, because that's something I would plug in quite often with my upper level uh, courses. And I know psychology, I mean, it crosses so many different areas, but uh, rather than always pulling in like a guest speaker, this is another way where they could go to a module. It gives that flexibility again. Um, but it'd be interesting if we could have some sort of repository where people are saying, hey, you know, I'd like to see something here, or even uh, I'm interested in this. Is anyone else interested? And uh, be able to build from there a springboard of sorts. So you've probably figured out we do have a lag. I think it's with um, Maria. So that was fine. Um, everything worked out fine, but things are a little a little weird. Um, but I think I think that's great. And and Canvas Commons is a great way to do that. As is Plymouth Create, right? So um, SharePoint is probably the most locked down because as of right now we're our own Microsoft campus, so it's harder to get um, in or out from from SharePoint than from the other two. Um, but these are also the kinds of things that Rachel and Martha and others can, can walk you through. Um, I think the conversation about what is online about a module is a really great question because of course it's, it's pretty hard to share something that, and this is like the same with OER, does OER have to be digital? Well, you can print OER, but like if it's not available digitally, it, it's pretty weird to share it. Like we actually had somebody, I can't remember whose job they were applying for. I think it was um, it was Esther's job, if y'all remember Esther, I won't gloss that at all, but the, somebody who uh, came and applied for Esther's job, she talked about making an OER and I asked where I could see it and she brought it to me the next day, it was a binder, but that was the only place that existed. And I was like, is that really like, helpful I don't know um, but really part of what happens right is in order to share we think about using technology um, but obviously a lot of the teaching that we do especially next year is going to be face-to-face -face. so thinking about modularity and face-to-face -face, hybrid and online is um, is going to be great food for thought um, I want to thank you all for doing this, um, especially to our presenters for sharing work that is still in process and particularly to our presenters for doing work that is in process because um, I know so many of us had to shave out everything that wasn't core to the job. So to keep, see you guys keeping your focus on this even just a little bit is really um, impressive. So thanks for, for sharing. I wanna remind you that this is recorded and that the slide deck will be available as a resource with this recording. One thing you might wanna do if it's helpful, we're just trying to encourage people um, to have conversations about this outside of our amazing posse of, of people. So if you're in your AU, if you're in your cluster, if, if you're talking with people in your program, um, you can always share the information from this. They can watch the recording and um, you can see if they're interested in having a longer conversation with you. So thanks everybody. Um, I'm gonna stop recording and feel free to stick around if you want to.